fail in the matter of entry, E3, ZA, and the second trust set for the home department. Uh, my Lords, my Lady, yes. uh, I appear in this matter with my learned uh, junior, Mr. McKenzie, uh, Mr. Shelton, King's Council, and Mr. Stansfeld appear for the uh, Secretary of State in this matter. Um, my Lords, my Lady, the issue obviously in this case is in one sense a very straightforward one which is what is the effect of uh, a successful appeal um, in relation to deprivation of citizenship. The factual background is probably largely irrelevant to that issue and is probably also very clear. Um, the note, I suppose, as much as anything, uh, in supplementary bundle page two, you see a letter which served uh, a notice of intent to deport at page three. Sorry, supplementary bundle. Page two. You see the cover letter yep. as an example, and I'm really in one sense taking this to an, as, as, as an example of what is probably of some importance, which is the procedure adopted. Um, you see the cover letter serving the undated notice of uh, uh, intention to make a, uh, a deprivation order. And so that was served on the uh, 2nd of June. And what that demonstrates consistent with the statutory scheme. And so is that, that's not correct, is it? That's not... Is that a reference to the decision or is it a reference to the order? That's a reference... Is it an intent to have an order made, yeah. Yeah, that's a reference. That's the first... Uh, well, well it, 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 it may help just to say at this stage, that certainly we would argue, and I'm not sure there's necessarily any controversy about this, that effectively there are three stages in deprivation. Firstly, the Secretary of State has to make a decision yeah. to deprive. And this is the question of fact is the deprivation decision, yeah. not the deprivation order. That yeah, that's, the, that's right. Then they have to serve the notice of that, deci uh, of in that decision to make, and then they can serve the deprivation order. And if you go over the page, you see that's what happened three days later. The order. Uh, well, four, two days later was the order, three days later it was served. SIAC obviously then considered the case, which is relevant particularly in the case of ZA. Um, SIAC considered the case uh, and delivered a judgment on the 15th of November 2018, uh, which is a supplementary bundle of page 8, and that allowed the appeal, one sees that at paragraph 110, allowed it on the basis of um, a finding that the uh, 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 appellants were both uh, stateless. There was no stay of SIAC's judgment, and during the period following that judgment, as is clear, clearly recorded in the High Court, on the 10th of June 2019, ZA was born. 10th of June 2019. It, it's, it, 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 for a reference to it in the papers, it's in paragraph 8 of Mr Justice Jay's judgment page 80 of the main bundle. Obviously, as I'm sure um, uh, the court will be aware, and indeed my Lord Lord Justice Flo may, be, um, uh, uh, may remember, the uh, Secretary of State appealed, and the appeal was allowed in an order of the 21st of November 2019, and that's in the supplementary bundle at page 31. That was then followed by SIAC considering the appeal of C3, C4, C7, whose cases on nationality were indistinguishable from E3 and N3. <coughs> and in a judgment delivered on the 18th of November 2021, um, uh, SIAC found that uh, uh, C3, C4, C7 were stateless as a result of the deprivation of their citizenship, 
uh, para 117, and we recognize this doesn't take you a huge amount of forward. <coughs> Paragraph 117, uh, SIAC expressed itself as, uh, as um, concluding essentially that the Secretary of State had no power to make deportation orders because uh, uh, the orders caused C3, C4, C7 to be uh, stateless. And the Secretary of State decided not to appeal that judgment and recognised the implications in this case and in a series of letters indicated that um, she was uh, withdrawing the deprivation order and indeed the notice. Um, and one sees relevant letters, supplementary bundle page 66, is the first letter which talks about the deprivation order being withdrawn and citizenship being reinstated. I should say in terms of that language of reinstated, obviously the High Court concluded that um, what that was a reference to, and it's paragraph 67 of Mr Justice Jay's judgment, uh, what that reflected was what, what he described as practical reality um, because of the fact there were administrative steps to, to be taken, but, but the withdrawal meant that uh, legally um, uh, the appellants were citizenship from the moment of withdrawal. I'll come back to that, but, but, but we submit that's consistent with the absence of any statutory provisions essentially providing for reinstatement. There was further correspondence, as I say, and further reasoning um, uh, in an email from the government legal department uh, dated 28th of April 2021, 20, uh, which is at page 61, 69 rather, the supplementary bundle. That is where the language slightly changes, so it makes it clear that it was a um, um, decision as well to, to, to make the individuals, uh, make the appellants statelessness, the stateless rather, sorry, no, the decision to deprive them of citizenship that, that was also being withdrawn. Again, talks about reinstatement. That, I think, in terms of the facts, probably is all I need to um, set out uh, for these purposes. Well, the, the, the first, the first, the main paragraph in the email of the 28th of April makes it clear that the Secretary of State's position is that although uh, the order, that's to say stage three, that falls away. The original decision, that's to say, stage one, um, and in in the earlier court of appeal case, we analysed it really as two stages: the decision and the order. I mean, you're right that technically there's a notice in between, but yeah, I don't think we need to worry about that. Yeah, we're at the first stage, and what the Secretary of State is saying here is is that the first stage, the actual decision which was made on the basis of reasonable grounds for belief that um, w remains um, a lawful decision. Well, what, what the Secretary of State is saying is, yeah, that's absolutely right. They're saying it remain, that, that, that decision remained lawful, but it also, halfway by the whole punch, in, in my version, halfway through that paragraph, probably slightly over that paragraph, halfway, I think about eight lines mm -hmm. into it, sentence stating the Secretary of State is now satisfied that the deprivation orders would um, make your client stateless and accordingly the decisions have been withdrawn is that the initial decision was also withdrawn and that has to be right because if the initial decision wasn't withdrawn then the appeal would have continued because the appeal is against that initial decision and uh, 
for the uh, SIAC rule to uh, cause automatic withdrawal of the appeal, which is what the Secretary of State was arguing for and what SIAC upheld, it is the initial decision that needs to be withdrawn. So that was the point I was making about withdrawal. I, I'm, yeah. So I think, as I say, in terms of the facts, that probably covers everything I need to cover. Yeah. Turning to the law, probably the whole of this court is pretty familiar with the relevant provisions, but um, they do require this is some consideration given, uh, I'm not sure there's any real dispute, dispute between the parties okay. that the statute is, 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 is central to the arguments. Um, section 40 of the nationality, British Nationality Act is obviously the power to deprive, and it's at uh, tab 30, using electronic bundles, page 1122. And subsection 2 is obviously the power to deprive if someone is, if, if the Secretary of State concludes that deprivation is conducive to the public good. That is the power that was being exercised in this case. That is, uh, 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 that, that power is uh, qualified by subsection 4, which uh, provides that the Secretary of State may not make the order under, sub sub uh, under subsection 2 if he's satisfied the order, order would make a person stateless. That's where the statelessness comes into play. Come back to that, but certainly we would su submit that the, the, the objective of that provision is to ensure that the United Kingdom is compliant with the uh, Statelessness Convention. Mm. Uh, and that's uh, consistent with Court of Appeal authority. Um, and then subsection five is where this sort of three stage, as I've described it, the two stage doesn't really matter, as, as my lord has said, um, process is, fa uh, it sort of is, 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 is really prescribed because subsection five is the, uh, what sets out what we would describe as a condition precedent for exercising the power under subsection 2, which is the issue of a notice uh, indicating that there has been a decision to make a deprivation order. Um, so the, the precondition for the notice is the, is the decision, but the notice itself has to precede the deprivation order. should say that... The, the, noted last night that in, in fact the, the 2022 legislation provides for the uh, that there is no requirement any longer to give a notice but I can't see that that's relevant to anything um, before the court today. So as I say that's the basis for the two stage, a uh, three stage or two stage depending on how one looks at it process. Sub uh, section 40A um, then deals with or provides for a right of appeal, um, which is either to the up tribunal or to SIAC, depending on uh, the nature of the case. Uh, but the critical provision is subsection 1, which uh, effectively provides that once you've been, well, no, it does provide that once you've been given a notice, so it is the notice that, that triggers the appeal right, uh, you can appeal against the decision. And obviously that's the decision that has to be made before the deprivation order. So you are, uh, and I'll come back to this, appealing against the um, decision rather than the deprivation order itself. And indeed, uh, and again, this, uh, I may come back to this, um, there is nothing that actually prevents the Secretary of State delaying making the deprivation order until after the decision, the appeal has been determined. And in some cases, I understand that's what happens. Um, uh, it is not automatic that, 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 that the procedure adopted in this case is, is adopted. Um, but that's a matter of choice for the Secretary of State now. Absolutely. There was previously provision saying uh, that the effect Suspense of the appeal would be to suspend the process. That is not now the case. Absolutely. And therefore the Secretary of State may make an order before the appeal is instituted or concluded and the effect of the deprivation order is to remove citizenship. 
Absolutely. No, I, and that's obviously what happened in this case. And there's no suggest, I mean, nobody's and nobody has suggested that that the procedure adopted in this case was unlawful for that reason. And that's clearly is, is the, any argument against that was answered by G1. And I accept that. That's that's right. But it, it equally is the case that you, you don't have to do that if you're the Secretary of State. It's a, it's a matter for the Secretary of State. But she's done it here, so it doesn't really matter that she didn't have to. No. Well, it, 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 it may be relevant for, to, this re, to this extent, uh, of course, which is that one of the things that we submit is that uh, one of the reasons why uh, our interpretation is correct is that uh, the Secretary of State's uh, uh, interpretation, which is, uh, which is obviously what was essentially upheld by Mr Justice Day, Jay, produces arbitrary consequences. And one of those arbitrary consequences is the, 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 the issue of whether you are a citizen during, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, for this period while your appeal is pending, and indeed the issue of whether or not you can pass on your citizenship to your child depends essentially on an administrative decision of the Secretary of State based on all sorts of issues to do with convenience and uh, etc. And that's what Parliament has decided. They've actually said that expressly by taking away the suspensive effect. Well, they've... they've, they've How can it be an arbitrary consequence? We can't say that Parliament's arbitrary, can we? It's a well, development. The, 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 the... What I'm saying is that 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 that, that um, I'm not saying that 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 that, that uh, the uh, provision that permits the, the making of a de deprivation order is, is is arbitrary. What I'm saying is that that what is an issue and in our submission uh, is is not expressly determined by the statutory scheme. We would submit our arguments are obviously consistent with the statutory scheme, but. Uh, the, the issue that arises once you've won your appeal, what is the retrospective effect of that? That is the arbitrary consequence. That's what that's that's what the Secretary of State is is is, is arguing for. It's, it's not that it is arbitrary to uh, uh, be uh, 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 denied your citizenship during the appeal the, the period of appeal, appeals pending. It's what is the retrospective effect? Well, what is the effect? You're assuming the answer to the question saying what is the retrospective effect. The question is what is the effect of an appeal? Uh, what well, what is the effect of the outcome of an appeal? Yes, that's obviously the issue in the case. Now, what the statute also doesn't specify is what the grounds of appeal are. There's nothing that, that indicates um, what appeal what appeal grounds you can you can bring. However, materially for this case, obviously, it's common ground that one of the things that SIAC has to determine is whether, in fact, an appellant is stateless. I'll come to the authority that makes good that point, but that is clear. Further, it's also clear, um, I can take you to it if you need to, but I suspect it's again not controversial. Uh, uh, it's clear from FAM, uh, which is tab 23, page 817, the relevant paragraph is paragraph 101, that the issue is whether you were stateless at the time the Secretary of State took your decision, took, it, took her decision rather. It's not whether you are stateless at the time of the appeal. So both of those uh, matters in our submission suggest that uh, 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 that uh, in the High Court, Mr. Justice Jay was. Uh, wrong essentially in terms of what the conclusion he reached about the effect of a successful appeal. He concluded that if an appeal is allowed, uh, SIAC uh, concludes as a matter of fact that an individual is stateless, but that doesn't impugn, impugn the deprivation order. In our submission, that's wrong in, because one has to ask why the factual finding matters. And in our submission, it, the, the reason why you can uh, appeal, essentially, on the basis that you will be stateless, is that what the British Nationality Act prohibits, among other things, is statelessness at the time of the Secretary of State's decision. I mean, clearly, normally, what you are doing when you are bringing an appeal is you are challenging 
a the decision that you're appealing. That's why it exists. And as, as people say, well, is that quite right, Mr. Sully? Does the statute in turn say that the person must not be stateless at the time that the Secretary of State makes the decision? Are we putting you a little bit too high? Well, the statute except doesn't expressly say that. Right. Um, what I'm saying is that there are two clear indications of the fact that that is implicit in the uh, scheme. One is uh, the fact, and I'll come on to this, that, 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 that the statute is intended to ensure compliance with the Statelessness Convention. The other is the fact that when you're appealing, what, Sy what SIAC is seeking to do is look at whether you were stateless at the time of the Secretary of State's decision. Does the Statelessness Convention have anything to say about procedures for appealing against decisions that bribe and veto their nationality? It, 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 it doesn't, but obviously once you get to the point where SIAC has concluded as a matter of fact that you are stateless, the Statelessness Convention in, in, implies that you should not have been deprived of your, well, no, it doesn't imply, it expressly says, Article 8, you should not have been deprived of your, of your citizenship during the period, um, uh, during, what, during any period, during the period when... Well, when does it simply say that, as a matter of fact, the person would be stateless, but the order for deprivation has to be made and there's no appeal available against the order for deprivation. Something has to happen for the order to be removed. The tribunal doesn't have jurisdiction to hear an appeal against the order, and it certainly doesn't have jurisdiction to quash the order, does it? Well, it doesn't have jurisdiction. There's, there is no quash power to make a quashing order. No. Um, but if if SIAC has concluded, this is why it goes back to what, what, what the relevance potentially of what is in issue to um, um, uh, Section 40. If, it, if SIAC has concluded that as a matter of fact, someone is stateless, the implication of that in our submission, what is it? the question is what is the relevance of that? And the relevance of that must be that the Secretary of State is not entitled to, um, uh, to, to, to make someone... Uh, she's uh, already done it. She's made them stateless before the decision of the uh, SIAC. All that we now know in the light of the SIAC decision is that as a matter of fact, had she known that at the time, she would not have been able to make the order. But that's a different set of circumstances, isn't it? Well, no, in my submission, because it, what in my submission, it, 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 the reason why, and this is why I was looking at what, what was an issue, the reason why you're looking at what the factual position, or the reason why SIAC, rather, is looking at what the factual position was at the time when the decision was made, and that's what SIAC is looking at, um, is because if, in fact, an individual is stateless in our submission, that must mean that the Secretary of State, uh, se the Secretary of State's decision is, is, is ultra virus because the Secretary of State has no power in our submission to make someone um, stateless. But she's done it, and um, she shouldn't have done it if she wasn't satisfied about that. But at the time she was satisfied, it wouldn't make a person stateless. With the benefit of hindsight and the clarity, about the meaning of the various Bangladeshi instructions, some of which were in Bangla, not English, it now becomes clear that she shouldn't have made that order. But the order was made. Well, but, 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 well, all that... And there's no appeal against the but, order. But the, 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 the argument that the decision is ultra violence runs, runs completely... Well, it seems to me that runs into um, what we said in the Court of Appeal in, in, the, in the previous appeal about the first and second stage, that... that, that at the time when the Secretary of State makes the, makes the decision, she reasonably believes that the decision won't render him them stateless. Um, that that aspect, as that's to say, the reasonable belief aspect, hasn't been challenged on this appeal. What well, you're challenging is 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 the as it were the use of the decision to make a, to make the order depriving. But, you, but you're not saying that, that the Secretary of State in this case never had, did not, at the time she, she made the decision, did not have reasonable grounds for believing. 
we, we're not uh, we're not saying that. But what we are saying is that given that um, uh, the appeal is against that decision, given that, as I say, there's no dispute, mm -hmm. certainly at this level, uh, that what SIAC has to decide is whether or not the individual was in fact stateless, and in this case, obviously, it was concluded that it was conceded ultimately by the Secretary of State mm -hmm. that they were in fact stateless. Mm -hmm. if, the fa if the, unless there's going to be some sort of disconnect almost between the decision you're challenging, which is the decision of the Secretary of State in the first stage, uh, 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 and what Syke is, 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 is looking at, uh, in our submission, the implication of the fact that you are challenging um, the uh, uh, fact of statelessness through the appeal, and you're allowed, probably more importantly, to challenge that, that is what the grounds of appeal are, must be that if, if you successfully demonstrate that, 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 that um, uh, you were stateless, then uh, if the appeal is to have effect, it must mean that, a, that, 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 that the decision of the Secretary of State is, is, is unlawful in the sense that it, 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 it results in, a, uh, in, in a, a position which the legislation doesn't tolerate, which is statelessness. But that, that, that's a similar sort of thing. It could mean something else. It could mean it's now been recognised that the order that was made would not be made today because the knowledge of the consequences is different. And the question then is, what, if anything, must happen next? Yeah. One might say, as a minimum, you must unravel it for the future within a reasonable period of time. So, for example, if the person a week later said to the secretary, I now want a British passport so I can travel and see my aged mother <coughs> in Bangladesh, the secretary said, would have to deal with that. So that would be one set of circumstances. What must she do now? The next set of circumstances is what, if anything, must she do in relation to a period of time that has already elapsed, when the citizenship has been deprived by the order which has not yet been quashed and not yet been withdrawn. But in my submission, the statute points away from that being the correct position in two, at least two significant respects. The first is, as already indicated, that the appeal is not in relation to statelessness at the date of the appeal. It is in relation to statelessness at the time the Secretary of State took the decision. Yeah. So looking at whether in fact, at the time the Secretary of State took the decision, she made the individual stateless. Secondly, there is, when one works through the British Nationality Act, in our submission, no power effectively, no express power at least, to, to use the language of the Secretary of State's Correspondence to restore state citizenship. Uh, the, uh, 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 the the correct route in our submission to if you if you think about how um, uh, 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 I think it's easier. I can't remember one of one of them predate one of them was born before the the British Nationality Act was in force. One of the appellants. Um, in, in the correct route in our submission by which today they are a citizen is because it remains because of section 11 of the British Nationality Act, which is at page 1120, which is the provision that deals with um, continuation of citizenship for people who were pre-British Nationality Act citizens. Is that? And that's the consequence of the Secretary of State withdrawing the order. Yeah. Exactly, but that's that, that's that's a point. Is that is that once the order is withdrawn, it has no legal effect. It, it, it has no legal effect. But that's the answer to the question. The question, though, is what is the effect? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, it, 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 well, I come back to well. That, that's why. I mean, three things really, in one sense. Um, firstly, it's why we. Do we do submit? One can we one can point to the consequences, uh, essentially, of the Secretary of State's interpretation, which include uh, denial of citizenship for ZA, uh, for example, because uh, 
when looking at how the statute is intended to, 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 to operate, whether it's retrospective or not, then in our submission we can look at that. Secondly, in our submission, what we're, we're entitled to point to the, the language of withdrawal, essentially, and what is, what, uh, and what is the effect of withdrawal. In our submission, it must be effectively that the decision is of no legal effect. And that's, we then submit, is consistent, obviously, with you, you the general... You just with the of no legal effect. The world could be different. It could be this. 2000, E3 was a <coughs> citizen of the United Kingdom. Between certain dates, when the order was made and the order was withdrawn, this is just a possibility, the person might not have been a citizen of the United Kingdom because that status had been withdrawn uh, from him. Then the Secretary of State takes a decision that she's going to take away the order withdrawing the status. So he meets the requirements for British citizenship. There's nothing to deprive him of that status after a particular date. Therefore, he's a British citizen again. From that date. From that date. And the question is, why can it only ever be one state of affairs which leads to the order being of no legal effect, as you put it? It does have legal effect, but during the date that it's in force and before it's quashed and set aside, it deprives that person of its But 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 that's why, in some senses, we we point to uh, um, the sort of case law most recently summarised by the Supreme Court in Majera about the impact of um, what are ultimately decided to be unlawful decisions during the period um, mm -hmm. where uh, they haven't been. Um, identified and qu uh, quashed if they're quashed or, or held to be unlawful is, is, is probably the better way of putting it because it doesn't necessarily... But this hasn't been held to be unlawful. It's been found with the benefit of hindsight that were the circumstances that are known now to have been known at the time that she made the order, she wouldn't have been able to make the order. But they weren't known and she did make it. Yeah. But, <laughs> but Lord, I, 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 I go back to the point, and this is why in one sense one needs to look at... Uh, what is the, pur the, the point I made before about the, the purpose of the um, British Nationality Act, Section 40, being in part to ensure compliance with the um, Statelessness Convention? If Section 40 is um, uh, uh, um, intended to operate in that manner, then uh, the Secretary of State has, in our submission, no power, and that's we, don't, we submit that is consistent with sub, sub, subsection 4 to make someone stateless. Uh, uh, and if they have made them stateless, albeit <coughs> on the basis of material they weren't aware of at the time, uh, that's the, the position. And, and uh, if they have made someone stateless, then the effect of that is that, 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 that the decision was in fact unlawful. So, so I, I don't think I'm following that. Sorry. So you're saying the decision is unlawful something that wasn't known to the decision maker when the decision was made. Yes. So that's it. Yes. Right, let me just get a note of that. And, and to use the facts of this case, the reason why I accept it's 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 material not known is because Well it just doesn't matter why you whether you accept it or not. I just want to understand the structure of your argument. Well, it's quite unusual for it a decision maker governed by public law to be held to have made an unlawful decision because of something he or she didn't know at the time he made the he or she made the decision, is it? Uh, it Unless there have been a failure to investigate, so well, uh, the same side failure. Not necessarily. I mean, the, 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 in in a rights context, I wouldn't necessarily accept that's that's correct because, for example, if you think about the approach to and we draw an, uh, draw an analogy with this, if you think about the approach to human rights litigation. Human rights litigation now requires, in a public law context, see misbehaving, the court to decide for itself whether there was a breach of, of, of human rights. The court isn't simply reviewing the decision of the Secretary of State. Not the, but that's, that's not the position that this, this how, this, the structure, whether it's SIAC or, 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 or the tribunal, the structure of, of the British Nationality Act appeals. Is, is not the same as, as what you've described. What the, what the, what SAC had to engage in was a, was a factual decision as to whether or not the person was rendered stateless at the time the decision was 
was made by the decision at the time the decision was made. And that's a separate question from the question of whether the Secretary of State had reasonable grounds for making the decision, reasonable grounds for believing that the, the decision wouldn't make the person stateless. So I, I just don't understand how um, success on the second point defeats the first point. Well, well, it, it goes back, well, I'll, I'll make a number of points in relation to that, but can I just start with the point I was making yeah. a, a, a moment ago, but, but at the risk of repeating myself, but, but, but it's important, it's not overlooked. Mm -hmm. My Lord put to me, what I think is, is what I understand to be very similar, obviously, to the approach of Mr Justice Jay, which was to say that when there is an appeal, um, SIAC is effectively making findings of fact, uh, and it's making findings of fact uh, uh, in relation to statelessness. And that's... The question in my submission has to be in relation to that. What is the basis upon which... Why, as a matter of law, is SIAC making those findings a fact? Because quite clearly, when you are, when a court is, or any court or, or or tribunal are making findings of fact, they are doing it because they are assessing essentially the legality of whatever issue is before them. It's to enable them to reach a conclusion about the legality of what they're doing. They don't courts don't make freestanding findings of fact. So the question then has to be, I, I, the question has to be, what, why, where, where, do, where does the jurisdiction, what, what is the jurisdiction to make findings of fact in this case? Where does it arise from? Why are the findings of fact being made? And in our submission, it, 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 it must be because uh, section 40 implicitly prevents statelessness. I mean, it's difficult to see what other what other basis there would be for site making findings of fact. But the problem is, does it prevent statelessness for all times? Or is it saying that if, um, given this changed state of knowledge, somebody would be rendered stateless, from that date onwards, you must impliedly correct the matter. If SIAC were to be given powers to deal with illegality, one would normally ex expect them to be there. There would at the minimum be provision to set aside the deprivation order, but they have no powers in relation to the deprivation order. They don't have powers to quash, and worse than that, they did, for a brief period, have a power to give a direction that the deprivation order be treated as if it had no effect, and that seems to be a problem for two reasons. One, it seems to assume that they couldn't quash because the Dooney had a power to treat as if it had no effect. And secondly, that power has been repealed. So one then begins to think, well, Parliament wasn't intending this tribunal to alter the legal status of the order. Uh, and it wasn't saying that it would be quashed for all times and never have had legal effect as you would have with a prerogative order. And therefore, the question is, what was the powers and what was the intention of giving the right of appeal to SIAC? Well, can I come back to the statutory history in a moment? Because yeah. it, so, so, and I will come back to it because in our submission, it, 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 it's no answer to the arguments. But our, our basic uh, point, answer to, to, to my Lord's question, which in some senses does overlap with the, the, the issue of that statutory um, <coughs> Uh, um, in the, the statutory history is that in principle the uh, uh, system it might be said could operate in two ways one is that SIAC makes these findings of fact after SIAC has made those findings of fact the uh, Secretary of State, which is essentially, as I understand it, the way Mr Justice Jay dealt with it, the Secretary of State then uh, has to engage with those findings of fact. 
The problem in our submission with that is those findings of fact, if they're to be of any uh, relevance, if they're to when be you, of any... When you say engage with the findings of fact, do you mean by that that the, that the Secretary of State will, um, in the light of the findings of fact, will withdraw the order? Is that the point you're making? Um, I, I was using the word engage deliberately for a reason I'm going to come on to in a moment, which is that although Mr Justice Jay's position was that, uh, that, 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 that in reality that, that engagement could, could mean nothing other than withdrawal of the decision, yeah. um, it's a, it, 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 if in fact these are just findings of fact, in one sense one, it becomes a little more complex to see why that should be the case, because if, if there isn't the prohibition on statelessness that we say is in, in, inherent in section 40, mm -hmm. it's a bit of a to see why the Secretary of State isn't entitled to say, if that is the way the scheme operates, well, I'm very interested in these findings of fact, but ultimately, you've not demonstrated I acted unlawfully. The, the legislation doesn't say I have to um, reinstate citizenship, it doesn't in fact contain any provision that uh, that, 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 that um, addresses reinstatement uh, in statement in those circumstances uh, given the public interest etc I'm going to rely on the legality of my decision now that is clearly in our submission not the, the way in which the statute is intended to operate I, I accept that there must be some purpose in giving a right of appeal and in allowing a second body to determine whether or not somebody was stateless and I understand your point that you look at it from the date of the decision but look at it in a different way. For two years before the Sire appeal, I assume it's two years now, that person was deprived of British citizenship. What that means, he didn't have a British passport. He wasn't entitled to call on the assistance of the British consular authorities abroad. He couldn't vote at a British election. He couldn't serve on a jury during that period. Yep. Is the purpose of the appeal to correct that? So going forward, he can now say, I want a British passport. If I go to Spain, I want the assistance of the consular authorities. And I do want to vote in the next general election. And I do want to be able to serve on the jury. It is seeking to put right for the future, or is it seeking to put right for the future, the consequences of an order that was made and now it's recognised it shouldn't have been made. You can't change the past, no, save for ZA. Well, the save for ZA... You can't unwrap, as it were, unravel the general election because he no. didn't vote, because he's now decided he should have been. No, for a local election... <laughs> One vote. I lived yeah. in a ward once where the seat was determined by one vote. You know, you can't but, unchange those matters. But, but, he shouldn't have, it shouldn't have happened, but it's happened. But, if, but are you submitting, Mr Sumley, that if in, in an appeal on a particular case, SIAC held at the time the Secretary of State made the declaration that um, the, the person was rendered stateless, how could the Secretary of State lawfully continue to maintain the order depriving that person of his or her citizenship, why wouldn't you be going straight off the court and saying to the court, the psych has now told the Secretary of State this person was rendered stateless. Uh, the order may have been lawful when it was made or it may not have been, but it can't be lawful for the Secretary of State to maintain the position that this person is stateless now, uh, sorry, uh, has no British citizenship now. And that's what the judge decided, effectively, that although the statute doesn't spell it out in terms, the Secretary of State would be on... Uh, uh, you know, if the Secretary of State were to ignore what SIAC said, then the consequence would be exactly what my lady says. Are you saying that it would be lawful for the Secretary of State to ignore what SIAC had found? Uh, well, I'm not... <laughs> I'm not saying that because of obviously what I'm saying, that the answer to these problems... No, no, we know what your answer is. I'm just asking yeah. a separate question to test the argument. Well, are you saying it would be lawful for the Secretary of State, in the teeth of a finding, clear finding by SIAC, that the person was rendered uh, stateless at the time the decision was made, to continue to maintain the order depriving that person of their citizenship? On the hypothesis that what we're looking at, which is obviously not my hypothesis, but what we're looking at is a situation where SIAC makes a finding that as a matter of fact someone was stateless at the date of decision, But there is no finding, indeed it's implicit in Sykes' reasoning possibly, that, 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 that the Secretary of State uh, reached 
a decision when uh, issuing the notice uh, that was unlawful in some way, and uh, because of public law, the Secretary of State had applied the correct test uh, on the material available, had reached the, sec the correct conclusion. So there was no, uh, this is on the hypothesis, which obviously I don't accept, that there was no unlawfulness at the time of decision right. based on that finding of fact. Then, in my submission, in circumstances where there's nothing in the legislation that says the Secretary of State is um, uh, uh, is is bound by is bound rather to uh, sort of reinstate citizenship following a, a, a successful appeal to SIAC, it would, in my submission, potentially be open to the Secretary of State to say, um, and to use the facts of Al, Al Jeddah as an example. Uh, it, it, to, to say, in this case, I remain satisfied that this individual is a, is, a, is, a severe, is, is a serious threat to the national security of the United Kingdom, and I am satisfied that they can address the problems they've got by uh, obtaining citizenship, by applying for citizenship. They're entitled to, I think it was Afghan in, in Al Jeddah's case, Afghan citizenship. But there, there was no separate provision in the BNA that deals with that situation, was there? If you've been naturalised. Are you relying on that provision? Saying in general, so I'm saying you saying it would be lawful for the Secretary of State, in, in, the, in the face of the clear language of the statute, to to maintain um, an order depriving someone of their citizenship when she knows that that person has been made stateless. Well, my, my lady, the, the 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 point I'm making, and it, 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 it and it's what. It, it, why in my submission well, are inter... Of course, I, I'm going to have to ask Mr. Sheldon whether that's his position, but, but I'd just like to know what your submission yeah. is. I, 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 but, but just picking up my lady's point, I think my lady re re referenced clear language. In our submission, the, the position isn't clear if the, high, if the findings of Mr. Justice Jay are correct. If the <coughs> findings of Mr. Justice Jay are correct, what that means is that SIAC's finding of fact in a case where its statelessness is found, does not establish illegality in the sense of a breach of section 40. That means there is nothing in the legislation that deals with the, 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 the situation that impl imposes a, a legal duty effectively to uh, correct um, the, the, the statelessness position. Um, all I'm saying is that all I accept that in probably the vast majority of cases, the Secretary of State would be compelled to do, uh, as Mr. Justice Jay indicated, compelled to grant citizenship. It, it's difficult to see when there is no statutory duty how there couldn't be circumstances where the Secretary of State would be entitled to say, as I say, to use the, the Al Jeddah case as an example, I am. I did not act unlawfully. I am satisfied you are still a threat to national security. And, in the, and given that you have a route to um, mitigate the uh, problems of statelessness, uh, I am satisfied that it's not unlawful for me to re refuse to reinstate your citizenship. But, but say the person is stateless and doesn't have any way of mitigating I don't, I don't know where you get this idea that people can mitigate their statelessness. A lot of people can't. Yeah. So, so that, I, I've just got, I'm afraid I'm but, just not following this. But, but, but that's one. I'm, saying, I'm not saying that in the, the, the vast majority of cases, <coughs> Mr. Justice Jay was wrong. All I'm saying is that there can be <coughs> situations where, for example, Al Jeddah being an example, where, um, uh, 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 where there is a, a, a route out of statelessness, perhaps is, is a better way of putting it than mitigation. Do you mean a route out of statelessness that's envisaged by the statute or some other route out of statelessness? I mean some other route. The, the fact that in Al Jeddah the route out was was um, obtaining Afghan citizenship. Yeah. That's a different point, I think, really. Uh, we're trying to work out what the statute means. The statute has drawn a distinction between deprivation orders and decision. It's allowed a right of appeal on decision. It's 
to be interpreted to say that that's got to be a decision as to whether or not the person has status at the time of the decision. And the next question is, what's the consequence of that? Nothing expressly spelled out. One possible implied consequence is that the Secretary of State, unless you've got a good reason, has to give effect to that and stop continuing to deprive him of his citizenship status. And the way to do that is to remove the order. You're arguing for a much broader consequence, not simply that she has to do it retrospectively, but that somehow the order was unlawful from its inception. And it's, that there are three stakes, really. Is it for the future? Is it for the past? And does it render the order a legal nullity? Was it unlawful to stop him voting in the uh, elections that took place during the um, period when he wasn't uh, a citizenship? And you would say yes, because he shouldn't have been stopped. Yes. Oh, my Lord, can I just come back on, on one thing that my Lord put to me? And I, I got distracted by something else, but my Lord, Lord, Lord Justice Lewis put to me. My Lord said to me, put to me this sort of example of elections and various other things that happened in, 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 in the meantime. And one of the points we have made and uh, continue to make is that on our um, uh, analysis, uh, uh, although in our submission it is, we would submit that, 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 that as far as the Secretary of State is concerned, there is no doubt that uh, the Secretary of State has to um, uh, treat the person uh, who succeeded as though they were, uh, well, as, as someone who was always a British citizen. The position in relation to third parties is more complicated because that's what, the, if, I mean, if, if this were, suppose the, a, 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 a Appellants had brought a judicial review of the um, decision, uh, the, the, the initial stage, the first stage decision, um, and it hadn't been ruled out because of alternative remedy or whatever. But let's assume for a moment that they would, were able to bring that judicial review. And they successfully dem demonstrated that the Secretary of State had acted unlawfully for some reason in relation to that decision. In our submission, what is clear following Majera in particular is that as far as the Secretary of State is concerned, the Secretary of State would then have to treat the, the individual as though they had always... If you have an administrative order which is quashed in judicial review, the effect of the um, quashing using the prerogative remedies is that the order has uh, no legal effect. Well, there may be a number of reasons why you would not quash it. One would be time, another would be discretion. So even in judicial review, it is not always the case that an order would be granted. But this isn't judicial review. But 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 but, it, but it's not. But my point about that is is, and it goes back to the army point is that is that it, the, the more fundamental question is not so much what the order would have been made. The question is what would the effect of finding that the the, the decision was unlawful was. That's not what the tribunal is doing. It's finding that, as a matter of fact, the secretary of state's order did make the person stateless. You, you're you're gunning at a different target in many respects. <laughs> Because what you're postulating in your example is some form of judicial review on the basis of the decision the Secretary of State made that she was she was satisfied, reasonably satisfied that, that um, the uh, she wasn't going to render them stateless was unlawful for some reason because, for example, no reasonable Secretary of State could possibly have held that belief. Now that's not the case that has ever been run. But, but, but I, can, but I can see that if you if you were running that case. Then the consequences might be different, but that's not this. That's not this situation. My Lord, all I was, what I was trying to do was answer the, the if you like, the the, the the concerns that were raised mm -hmm. about the impact on uh, third parties. And what I was mm -hmm. what I was trying to demonstrate was that 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 that, that, that um, the case law. Or what I was trying to argue was that the case law now establishes that 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 that. Where you have an unlawful decision yeah. that um, is subsequently demonstrated to be unlawful, mm -hmm. there is a distinction between the position of the decision maker, yeah. who yeah. potentially bears those consequences, and the position of third parties, who may still be able to say, well, I acted in good faith, believing the decision was a lawful one at the time the decision was made. And so the concern, essentially, that was being raised by my lord, that... <laughs> 
all sorts of things potentially happen during the period of the appeal when mm. the individuals were treated as not being citizens. All sorts of the concern that was, was essentially raised um, it, it is, is not as grave a concern as perhaps was being... my concern. I'm not concerned that somebody's going to sue the election officer yeah. for not allowing you to vote. I'm simply pointing out that there is a state of affairs that has happened and there is a state of affairs going forward. And the question is, is the um, consequence of the statute that you must stop things continuing to go forward, or is it that you must try in some way and give a status that the person did not have because of the existence of the order because of your new factual finding? That's my concern, is what is the statute about? And is it saying, we realise now that we shouldn't have taken it away, so we'll take away the order and you'll get it back. Or is it, we shouldn't have taken it away, we now realise, and we're going to take away the order and pretend we didn't do it. But the, the, that's, in, in one sense, that the, the, the distinction uh, it, 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 as to whether this should have perspective effect or retrospective effect is not perhaps as, as, as clear as suggested. Because if you think about the situation with ZA, uh, for example, the position of the um, uh, 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 of ZA is about the position going forward because ZA is concerned to be issued with a passport, be, be treated as a British citizen from, from now on. Um, and uh, what the Secretary of State, in, in one sense, is, is, is doing is saying, even though I now know at the date of decision, and it, because that's what SIAC was focused on, you were, uh, your father was, 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 was stateless, and so it shouldn't have happened effectively, to use a neutral language. I am going to continue to uh, 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 treat. Uh, your father is someone who was um, denied British citizenship for the purposes of assessing your citizenship. Um, but the question for ZA is a very harsh and sad question is, on the date of her birth, did her father have British citizenship? And the answer was no, he didn't, because it had been withdrawn. And the only question then is, when you have the decision in SIAC, is it to be projected backwards or only forwards? So I know it's harsh for ZA, but you can't avoid the fundamental question of what is the statute intending to be the consequences of an appeal. Um, and if it's worked harshly or not harshly, that is the working out of the appeal. Well, it doesn't help that somebody suffer. Well, it, 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 it does help in my submission to this extent, which is that... Um, Clearly, it, 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 when looking at statute, one looks at the statute as, as, as a whole, and one question that one can legitimately ask is, did Parliament intend effectively to have that, co that consequence, particularly in circumstances where we submit that the, the, the language of the statute is at least as consistent with our arguments as... But their day will not be stateless. Their day is a national of Bangladesh. If the statute is concerned with preventing statelessness, we need not worry. ZA has the status of a friendly Commonwealth country. What you would like is her to have a different status. Absolutely. And a status which, had there not been, and I, I use the language... If the world had been different, she might have got. Well, no. If her mother was French, she might have got French nationality. But that wasn't the world. <laughs> but, but more importantly, if the Secretary of State had correctly understood the position of Bang in relation to Bangladeshi citizenship, she, she, she would have got. Um, that's the, the, the more significant thing. Um, on the findings of SIAC, or not the findings of SIAC, but the findings of SIAC in C3, her father was stateless at the time of the decision, and as a result, shouldn't have, shouldn't, and I use the word shouldn't deliberately to, to try and make it neutral uh, for these purposes, her father shouldn't have been deprived of citizenship. Um, but the Parliament hasn't required the Secretary of State as a condition of making uh, to be right about the question of statelessness. It simply said the Secretary of State has got to be satisfied. And also, Parliament has withdrawn the 
suspensive effect provision. What? Which does. Um, so, so that the answer to my Lord's question, what was the position uh, at the time when the decision was made, is that, is that um, E3 wasn't a British citizen. So she, she can't be a British citizen in her it's, ha it's hard. Uh, uh, it's very hard. And no doubt Secretary of State will um, bear that in mind. But it is um, particularly harsh. Well, uh, obviously there, one I mean, of the there are all sorts of routes by which the Secretary of State could alleviate matters, for example, by waiving the £1,012 fee or whatever. But that, those aren't before us today. No. No. Um, no. Uh, and if, as you say, the purpose is to protect against statelessness, ZA is the status of a friendly Commonwealth country, is a national well, friendly Commonwealth country. Yeah. Well, I, 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 we certainly would, I'm not presiding from our submission that one of the, 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 the key purpose of Section 40 is to, is to protect against statelessness. All I'm saying is that uh, obviously Section 40 needs to be read in, in the context of the Nationality Act as a whole, and clearly one of the other provisions, well, other provisions of the Act, I think it's Section Two from memory, is intended to ensure that citizenship is 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 uh, passed on by by father to daughter. Um, if they're British at the time and they have the daughter, yeah. <clears throat> Person born outside the UK after commencement shall be a British citizen if at the time of the birth, at the time of the birth, his father or mother is a British citizen. Otherwise, you can't just say. Exactly. If you ask that question, the answer is no. But 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 you, it goes back to the fact that 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 what we now know, because of SIAC's findings, uh, it, it is that. Um, Date of decision. But it's a circular argument with respect, Mr. Sunny. The, the, the answer to the question that we have to answer on this appeal will not be reached by looking at the position of ZA. It, it, it all turns on the position of E3 and N3. Yeah. Uh, and if, if, if Mr. Justice J is right and this appeal fails, then one effect, and it's a harsh effect, it's true, will be that your, your client is not a British citizen by virtue of Section 2. And we'll have to make an application. If, on the other hand, the appeal succeeds, then she won't. Well, but it doesn't answer the point as to, well, whether, as to whether the effect of, of, of withdrawal, the withdrawal which took place, is retrospective or prospective. I, 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 it's well. Can I put it? I, I would put it slightly differently. I certainly accept that it is not a conclusive answer to that question. What I would submit, though, is that. Uh, in circumstances where the legislation is uh, 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 does not have express provision in dealing with uh, the issue in question, certainly not an express provision, one factor that can potentially be considered is um, whether or not Parliament intended to have the, uh, intended that the legislation would have these harsh consequences and th and these consequences are in, in our submission entirely foreseeable because and what is there in the act that makes it um, relevant to construing the powers of SIAC and the powers of the Secretary of State that somebody who might otherwise have been a British citizen is not a British citizen because it's not the purpose of statelessness because she's not stateless um, it's not the wording of section two so what is it which paragraph uh, which section are you pointing to to say well Parliament can't have intended that well what I'm what I'm suggesting is that is that the the net effect uh, in ZA's case is the product of um, if 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 Mr Justice J is correct of of Section two read with Section forty and if we're correct it's the same it's the product of Section two read with Section forty uh, and and Section forty a. When you've got conflicting interpretations, and we've we've got the one we argue for, and obviously uh, the Secretary of State argues for Mr. Justice Jay's interpretation, it is legitimate to look at which which interpretation produces harsh consequences. 
Can I ask you a third question, please, Mr. Southerly? Yeah. Um, might it be thought that it is necess it's, it's necessarily implicit in the statutory scheme that although Parliament has not required the Secretary of State to be right about the question of statelessness when she makes her decision, if it later turns out that she was wrong, um, it is necessarily <coughs> implicit that she must withdraw the order? Well, the, 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 this goes back, obviously, to the point I was making before as to whether, uh, as to what the consequences of a finding of fact are. Um, well, how, how can the Secretary of State continue to be satisfied that the person is not stateless if Syed has told her, having looked at the expert evidence on the topic, that the person was stateless when the order was made, uh, decision was made? But, but, but the problem, the, 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 the difficulty, in one sense, in my, that I have uh, with that way of analysing the case is that there is nothing in the legislation that imposes a continuing duty on the Secretary of State effectively to keep the issue of statelessness under, under review. The... Um, SIAC is looking at the, the situation at the date of decision, essentially. And so, in my submission, the, 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 the more natural way of analysing this scheme is that where SIAC finds that an individual was stateless at the time, at the date of decision, and that's why I emphasise it, the order shouldn't have been made, that, there were, that, that ultimately the order was, was ultra-virus effect. Uh, well, that brings the question: Why didn't they give a right of appeal against the deprivation yeah. order? Yeah. And why did they, no, when they changed the suspension provisions, actually say they could treat it as if, and then they withdrew those as well? So it's why is it only against the deprivation order, and what's the significance of the statutory history in removing that apparent possibility? Well, because the, the withdrawal of the suspend or the, or the repeal of the suspensive. Can, and then replace it. The, the, initially, they thought that the order would never be made, and when they took away the suspension, they said you can direct it just to be treated as if it had no effect. And now that has gone. It seems to be that Parliament assumed that absent provision for shall be treated as if it had no effect. The consequence of the statute was that it would <laughs> have effect during the period during the period that it was in force, which which runs against your argument yes. about parliamentary intention. Um, being well, that there wouldn't be harm consequences. Well, two 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 points. I I I I'll deal with the statutory history now. Obviously, we accept that that there have been two significant changes in relation to the legislation. Um, I, I, initially, obviously, this issue couldn't have arisen because, as the lords have already pointed out to me, uh, and obviously I clearly accept, there was a, a, effectively a provision that prevented. That, that, that prevented the equal deprivation order during um, uh, during an appeal. Of course, it is still possible for the Secretary of State to um, uh, merely take a, a, a issue a notice and not take the issue a deprivation order. Uh, and indeed, understand that happens. So, in terms of uh, the the, um, uh, the point that was made to me, a, I'm trying to remember the, the point I'm trying to uh, answer at this at this stage. But in terms of um, uh, um, why you there is no appeal essentially against the deprivation order in my submission, that's in part because of the fact the Secretary of State uh, wanted it, uh, apparently to retain the, the power to delay making a deprivation order. It, it, the I, whole idea of the scheme quite clearly is that, 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 that the Secretary of State can, if that's considered efficient, uh, um, make a deprivation order so that, that, that um, any immigration consequences can be dealt with at the same time, but doesn't have to. So in those circumstances, it's not surprising that the appeal remains against the notice. What about the Provision at one one two seven then. Sorry, one one two. 
1127 is the um, is 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 the provision to make dec declarations. And uh, uh, in my bundle, the next tab 31. Yeah. You've got subsection three of section 40A, which is now gone after they removed the suspensive power. It said the following provisions of the National Immigration Asylum Act shall apply in relation to an appeal under this section. They apply in relation to other appeals. Successful appeal direction, for which purpose direction may in particular provide for an order under section 40 about to be treated as having had no effect. And that appears to be assuming that absent such an amendment, the normal powers would not involve the consequence of treating the um, uh, order as having had no effect. And now that that power is gone, doesn't that seem to indicate that Parliament thinks that the effect of an appeal doesn't affect the order? Well, the Lord, we would submit in relation to that um, that when that power existed, consistent with both Boafo and Ahmed, the making of a direction fundamentally didn't change the nature of, uh, or the impact rather, of, of, of a decision of SIAC. It, 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 the, 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 any order was, any order was declaratory rather than um, necessary. Um, Boafo is at tab nine, page 416, the relevant page, paragraph 27, a judgment of Lord Justice Old, dealing with the underlying provisions in immigration legislation. where Lord Justice Old was of the opinion that the absence of a direction didn't change the effect of an adjudication. And in our submission that... Finding force. Does it deal with the question that we've got? And, that, and from what time, historically or from now? It, it, it does doesn't... Apply. No, it doesn't deal with... The, it, uh, all it deals with is what the general position in, in relation to the power of... Um, I think they may have been called immigration judges at that stage. I lose track of the various titles they've had. But, but immigration judges uh, to, to make directions was at that stage. It deals with that. And in our submission, that's entirely consistent with the approach that was adopted in Firstly, what in were the facts of Rafa then? Were, what, was somebody saying that a decision of the tribunal could simply be ignored? Or the judge could be ignored? Uh, well, the, 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 the argument essentially was that, that yes, that, as I understand it, of going to the head, head notes at 408. Um, so the claims appeal was bound to it, and he had to give her indefinite leave to remain, i.e. for the future, not from the date that she refused. No, but, but, but the, the fundamental point still was, was that the Secretary of State was relying on the absence of a direction. And what Lord Justice Old was concluding was that direction doesn't change the underlying... Binding nature binding, of the decision. Binding we nature. dealing with a different point is... And from what date did that decision take effect? But anyway, I've got the point here. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but I would submit that's consistent with the approach that the Supreme Court adopted in Ahmed when Ahmed, Ahmed is in, uh, is at tab one, page 159, the relevant passage. Um, the Lord may remember, well, I'm sure does remember <laughs> Ahmed, which was obviously the case where the the terrorism regulations were quashed, and the Secretary of State essentially was seeking to, um, uh, the Treasury rather, was seeking to uh, uh, delay any order to enable new legislation to be enacted. That's a different question. That's what's the consequences of a prerogative order, which was a special set of orders created by the common law. And the normal position is that the making of a quashing order uh, means that everything is invalid from its inception, although there are arguments and articles saying that, in fact, it is open to the court when granting a prerogative order to limit it. Yep. That's a different starting a point. Different starting. But well, the, po the point I'm making is, it's not that the order was different. If one goes to paragraph four, at page 159, 
paragraph or what? Sorry. Uh, Lord Phillips at 159. Sorry. There are t uh, I'm afraid there are... Th th Army is always a pain because there are there's a main judgment and then the, this is a supplementary judgment dealing with relief. So it's 159 of the authorities, uh, page 4. Paragraph para 4, sorry, para 4. Yeah, okay. Uh, Lord Phillips there. It's from the third line in where he's dealing with the argument about suspense and makes the point that whatever the order made, the order effectively is... is doesn't, doesn't actually change matters because of the fact that the, the court had found illegality. You know, because they found that the orders are ultra-virus uh, ultra no effect in law. And that is not what this tribunal finds. That's the whole point. Well, except, respect the law, that, that then raises the question of... The, it's the last sentence that's critical there, isn't yes. it? Because what he's saying is, well, suspending it, suspending the quashing, it doesn't difference. actually make any difference because what the the what the quashing is doing is making plain what's already been decided, which is this is ultra virus yeah. of no effect. Well, that's completely different from the from, from this, this case. case. Well, my lord, except to <laughs> to this extent, which is why why I've dr drawn attention to it, which is that my lord was putting to me the effect essentially of the amendment that got rid of the power to make directions, and. I am saying, what I'm saying in relation to that is that if we're correct, and obviously, and, and, and I, statutory history ultimately in, in our submission probably doesn't take one a, a, a huge way foot, foot forward, but if we are correct that the effect of a, a, a finding of statelessness is that um, the initial uh, uh, decision of the Secretary of State and the deprivation order are unlawful because they produced um, uh, statelessness, then the power to make directions similar to the position in Ahmed is effectively declaratory in the sense it is making clear what the position is. It doesn't change what the effect of that finding is. No, I accept that. If you are right that it's unlawful and that the effect of the grant of the right of appeal is that the tribunal finds that it is unlawful, that is, it is of no legal effect, then the changes doesn't affect it. What I do wonder out loud is, in trying to answer that question, what is the effect of a successful appeal? Is it, as Mr. Sully says, unlawful from the beginning, or is it different? The fact that there was a specific power contemplating that uh, it wouldn't be treated as having had no effect unless there was a specific power providing for that, is an indication as to whether or not you're right on your primary factor. So I accept if you are right, it makes no difference, but I'm using it at an earlier stage in the analysis to see if you are right. Well, but, but the, the, the difficulty in my submission is that, it, well, there, 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 this is why in my submission it, it, it appears to be, the, the repeal appears to be, oh, the, 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 the provision itself, um, it, 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 it says little, and certainly the appeal says little uh, 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 about the issues in the case. Firstly, um, uh, one could assume, in, in my submission, the Parliament understood the correct legal position, essentially, and the correct legal position is, as I've already indicated, which is that 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 um, that that. that uh, any power to give directions is, uh, in many cases, uh, we would submit uh, merely declaratory. Um, that doesn't mean it's of no, uh, it's otios, as my learned friend argues. It simply means that, 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 that the court is effectively making the correct position clear. Um, and that means, uh, as I say, that, 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 that it says very little potentially about the uh, issues in this case. And secondly, the second problem with relying on it in, in our submission is that when you get then to the position of, 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 of repeal uh, of this, um, the, the, one, the, 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 the most obvious explanation for the, the repeal is that, that there was a repeal of the underlying immigration provisions. And, and it was nothing to do effectively with, or it was very little to do with it, it was just, you didn't have the, the underlying immigration power.
uh, and the reason for the, the repeal of the immigration power, um, certainly given in Parliament, which we've identified in Skeleton, we can provide the full text of the debate, was simply that, 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 that there was a concern it was causing confusion. So on the face of it, in our submission, the there's no reason to believe that the enactment wasn't intended to be declaratory and the repeal appears to have been prompted by concerns to do with immigration. But aren't you arguing against yourself now? Because you're saying that the effect of a successful appeal is declaratory. Um, so wouldn't it follow from that that if yeah. SIAC found that the person was stateless at the date when the decision was made, the Secretary of State would be obliged to withdraw the order? Well, what I mean by declaratory is that if I'm right about the, 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 the position... What is, it, what is it declared? Well, it declared... It, 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 if, if I'm right, it, what we would say it declares is it declares that the um, uh, uh, decision to make the deprivation order and the deprivation order them itself were both unlawful because they resulted in statelessness. understand how that could be right, given the express language of the statute, which doesn't, as I've already put to you, require the Secretary of State to be right about the question of statelessness when the yeah. person makes the decision. Well, he could have said, um, subparagraph 4, Secretary of State may not make an order under subsection 2 if the order would make the person stateless. Hmm. Can I come so on to... The, so there'd only be one test, it would be objective. Well, can I, can I come on to... Two, two judgments that in my submission um, support right. my position. Yep. The first, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, given um, uh, uh, what was said by uh, Mr Justice Jay, was, uh, is, is Al Jeddah and what was said by Lord Wilson in Al Jeddah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Al Jeddah, the relevant passage of Al Jeddah is at, uh, it's, sorry, it's at tab uh, uh, three, uh, and the relevant passage is page 211. Before we go to the um, passage, I'm deeply resistant to things being taken out of context. So, what was the actual issue and facts here? Well, the issue was, it, it summarized uh, paragraph one. Um, it, the issue was whether the Secretary of State was entitled to um, take account when depriving someone of citizenship um, of uh, the ability of an individual to apply for um, citizenship for, for another state. So the, the issue was when the Secretary of State initially takes uh, the decision, the, the section 40, subsection 4 decision, could the Secretary of State say, well, you can in fact apply for Afghan or citizenship? Yeah. Well, no, the question is, is it her order which would make him stateless, or is it his failure to yeah. make the application? It's his decision. So, yeah. Yeah. so that's what the issue was. Yes. And you want to go Sorry, to... Sorry, Iraq, not Afghan. It was Iraqi, not Afghan. Um, if you go to para 30... Headed argument. Headed argument, but it actually is... It's a slightly odd heading that, because ultimately... It's the last heading, and it's clearly actually where the reasoning of the judgment is, because it's dealing. There is there, it, 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 it's resolving the issues essentially. Um, um, uh, para thirty sets out and then addresses an argument of the Secretary of State, and the Secretary of State, unsurprisingly, given what was an issue, placed a significant weight on the relevance of satisfied. And 
Lord Wilson um, started. Uh, just well, he said it adds nothing, but, but well, but I was going to focus on what was at issue in Al Jeddah. The, the question that was at issue in Al Jeddah was whether the Secretary of State was allowed to take into account um, things. As, uh, um, sorry, I'm thinking about articulate. As Lord Wilson put in paragraph 32, uh, was allowed to take into account um, the relative potency of causative factors, and he said no. But but the critic, the, the point we rely on, I mean, it is not so much the the analysis essentially of <coughs> what is meant by well. It is an aspect of the analysis of what is meant by satisfied, and, and, and clearly Lord Wilson believed he needed to deal with that, given the Secretary of State's argument. But in this case, nothing turned on the, word, the use of the word satisfied. And, it, and, it, and it's accepted on this appeal, as it, as it was accepted on the last appeal, that what's said by Lord Wilson is overserved. But Because if it hadn't been overserved, then we'd have been bound by it on the last occasion. But, but what in our submission... So what, what's, the, what's the point of referring to this, given that the Court of Appeal in the decision in E3 and N3 said, uh, I said in terms, I, I, I don't agree with this, well, and that was the ratio of that decision in, in the previous appeal, was that, that, that these words, is satisfied, in subsection 4, have a real meaning, as set out in that decision. Well, my Lord, the, the point I'm relying on this for is not because of whether or not satisfied has a real meaning, because that is obviously, as, as Maud said, determined by E3 and N3. Yeah. It is the, the end of paragraph 30, and the end of paragraph 30 is where what Lord Wilson in my submission is saying is whatever the meaning of uh, 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 satisfied is, ultimately it is still effectively governing the approach to the same issue that SIAC has to decide, which is statelessness. So it's it's it's... That's the point that we rely on this for. It's not. It's not whether there's one or two stages, or whether satisfied has a, has a meaning. It, 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 we're not arguing it doesn't have a meaning. What we are arguing is that the um, is that ultimately, although the Secretary of State applies a one sense one, in one way of putting it would be a different threshold uh, to that issue. The issue is the same. But you've got to see that the, those statements um, in the context of the argument <coughs> that Lord Wilson was dealing with. <coughs> so, so he says, at, at, Lord Wilson says at the bottom of page 268, irrespective of whether the word satisfied in subsection 4 can sensibly be formed in any at all, it's clear it cannot bear the weight that Mr Swift seeks to ascribe to it. He contends it confers latitude <coughs> on the Secretary of State look beyond the ostensible effect of the order to the active cause of any statelessness, blah, blah, blah. So it's in that context that Lord Wilson is making the observations that you rely on. It's a completely different case. But, Malay, I'm not, obviously, I, I accept that for, there are very significant distinctions between this case and what Lord Wilson was saying, but it goes back, the reason I draw attention to in particular, the last few lines of paragraph 30, is it goes back to the point I was making before about how um, when you're looking at considering what it is SIAC is considering, why is it necessary for uh, uh, SIAC to consider statelessness? And in our submission, it must be, because fundamentally, which is consistent with the last few words of, of, of of Lord Wilson, fundamentally, the legislation is concerned to prevent statelessness, uh, and that, in my submission, is 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 really what what Lord Wilson is uh, is it, well, what Lord Wilson is saying is that both side and, and the Secretary of State have to address that issue of statelessness, albeit in different ways. And statelessness might be prevented by. Sire getting it right on the 1st of January 2020, and the Secretary of State accepting that. So statelessness will not occur from the 1st of January 2020 onward. It doesn't address 
the fundamental question of what about periods prior to the tribunal finding state case. I understand the state question of fact, and being a nerd, I looked at the 1981 Act as originally drafted, where it said where it appears to the Secretary of State, rather than the Secretary of State is satisfied. And the satisfied must be a stricter test, and the Secretary of State is supposed to look at it, and she's supposed to ask herself, now, am I satisfied? Is this guy going to be stateless or not? And she might get it right, she might get it wrong. The world may change. The High Court in Bangladesh may say, no, 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 he doesn't lose his statelessness. Two years later, the Supreme Court in Bangladesh might say, no, actually, that was wrong. He does lose his Bangladesh nationality. All sorts of things can change. There can just be a mistake. And the fundamental question is, looking at the statute as a whole, what was the intention of Parliament by giving the power of the right of appeal against the decision? And your simple argument is, because it is looking at the same factual issue that the Secretary of State was looking at, Parliament must have intended that its decision in some way takes effect from the date that the Secretary of State first made her erroneous decision. That's your simple yeah, argument. In part, yes, absolutely, in part, because if that's not the case, you do have a period of statelessness effect. Yes, yep. exactly. What, what, what exactly uh, in what Lord Wilson said in this passage in the judgment do you uh, say supports your case on this appeal? On this, on this appeal, it is the final five lines, well, the, the, yeah, effectively, effectively the final five lines of paragraph 30, um, uh, uh, um, which is starting with the words whether, whether the requirement. But you will already have had a period of statelessness. The person was stateless. He couldn't vote. He couldn't ask for a British passport. If arrested in Cyprus after a party, he couldn't ask to see the British consul. You can never change the fact that he was treated as stateless during that period. Yeah, but, but that's why I'm going back to the position of ZA as an example of this. What we're actually, what, what we're asking, uh, it, 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 um, the, the, the issue that really arises, and this is why I'm saying it's 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 not as simple as necessarily as whether or not issue whether it's simply perspective or, or retrospective. What we're arguing about in, in many respects is whether the Secretary of State now should treat should continue to treat him having as having been stateless during the period. But he was stateless because there was an order in force that said you've lost it, and that hasn't yet been quashed. It's a circular well, argument. I mean, you just around it. The simple question is, was the statute intended to remove all legal effect from the order? It doesn't say that, and the question is, can you get it by implication? And you say you can, because it's looking at the same facts. Well, yeah, it's looking at the same facts. It is intended uh, to address stateless, uh, to, to uh, uh, ensure compliance with the um, statelessness convention, uh, and because um, Ultimately, if if uh, the approach of the um, uh, Secretary of State is correct, one has this slightly odd jurisdiction where uh, what is in, is an issue is not actually the um, decision that's being challenged. One ends up with a situation where the appeal is essentially about some freestanding facts that are then meant to prompt action by the Secretary of State. It's not a challenge to the initial decision. But the aim is to make sure he wouldn't be stateless from the date of the decision of the tribunal, perhaps. And also, when Lord Wilson said, it is only the treatment of the fact in my mind which subject to the context is governed by the word satisfied. And quite apart from the fact this whole analysis is, if you like, infected by his view that satisfied didn't really mean anything. And it's all over to that la those last few words suggest to me that he, he clearly wasn't addressing the question is what what is the effect of, 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 of an appeal succeeding on the original decision that that passage suggests that he might very well have reached the conclusion that um, the decision and the um, the order were two different things and that the, the mere fact that the order had to be withdrawn didn't mean the decision itself was unlawful but we don't know because it wasn't wasn't an issue before 
House of Lords at the Supreme Court. Before we leave our chair, Mr. Southern, you, you, I asked you whether it was necessarily implicit in the statute that in Sarnak decided that the person was stateless at the date of the deprivation, deprivation, deprivation decision. Um, the Secretary of State should withdraw the order. And you said, oh no, the Secretary of State would be, might be entitled to do what she did in Algena. But the House of uh, the Supreme Court held that what the Secretary of State did was unlawful. But, so but, how does Algena help? But Algena, the, the, the point I was making, to, just to be completely clear, is we submit which we would submit is consistent with the outcome of Al, Al Jeddah, obviously, that the, the, the find, a finding that someone was stateless at the date of decision means that the decision essentially uh, was unlawful, shouldn't have been made because of the um, prohibition on statelessness within section 40 and um, effectively it, it has no effect. The secretary, the, the point, the, as I understand the position in relation to um, uh, 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 Mr. Justice Jay's judgment, or the, 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 the adopt, approach adopted by Mr. Justice Jay, is that what Mr. Justice Jay was saying, essentially, is that once you've had a positive finding of fact by the Secretary of, uh, by SIAC, a, a finding of fact that you were stateless, the Secretary of State then needs to take action. But of course, the Secretary of State is taking action not at the date of decision, which is what was an issue in Al Jeddah. The Secretary of State is taking action um, sometime after that decision uh, and in circumstances where what the Secretary of State on Mr Justice Jay's uh, uh, analysis is doing is taking a fresh decision. Now, at the time of that fresh decision, it's not governed apparently by statute because there's nothing in, in the statute that deals with how the Secretary of State should deal with it. My point relying on, relying on Al Jeddah was that in those circumstances where it's not, the issue isn't subsection, uh, subsection 4 of section 40, it is should the Secretary of State use some discretionary power, use some power to reinstate rather, it's difficult to see why the Secretary of State isn't entitled to come back and say, well, I know my uh, initial decision was taken in circumstances where it produced, it produced statelessness, but I'm now in a position where things have moved on. Um, suppose Mr. Al Jeddah had obtained, by the time of, of the appeal, uh, Iraqi citizenship. Why would the Secretary of State not have been entitled, we submit he, he, he potentially would have been, to say, well, actually, I know initially this produced statelessness, but there's no statelessness now. I am not going to exercise my powers in your favour. Well, he could have made a fresh decision, or, or she could have made a fresh decision. But on those facts, and avoid any any um, concern about whether or not uh, he or she, I can't remember what it was in 2014, it's probably she, wasn't it? It's probably yeah, it was Mrs. May, May, it was Mrs. Mrs. May, I think, wasn't it? Yes, whether, yes, I think it probably was. was sorry. Whether she was ignoring a, 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 a ruling of, uh, of SIAC, just by making a fresh decision on the basis of, as, of, as of the date of that decision, and he clearly wasn't stateless because he had Iraqi nationality. Well, but that's not this doesn't help. This doesn't help. No, None of this helps. Well, you said there was another case. You said there were two cases. Two cases. I wanted the, other the, the other one I just wanted to put, mention in passing, which was the point about um, uh, uh, the, it's B two, which is the which, which makes the point about the need for Section forty to be construed with uh, consistently with the statelessness convention. Yeah, that begs the question, what is the Statelessness Convention all about? Is it about looking after people so they aren't left stateless? Or is it about rectifying past errors when things have gone wrong? It, it, it's, about, it's about preventing people. The, the key provision is Article 8. Mm -hmm. And Article 8 prevents a state making someone stateless, other than in circumstances which clearly don't apply and in these cases. Yeah. Yep. She made him stateless, and she breached Article 8. She breached Article 8. So... So we must stop that and we must correct it. Well, and recognise, and this is why in our submission, well, it has to, uh, uh, section, uh, Article 8 has two consequences in our submission. Firstly, would it help if we actually had a date written rather than? Yes, sorry, I've, I've, tab 29. it's tab 29 1103. 
one contracting state shall not deprive a person of its nationality if such deprivation would render him stateless. There are um, qualifications to that in what follows, but I don't think it's been suggested any of those are relevant. Um, uh, uh, in, in the sort of circumstances we're looking at. So, on the face of it, once SIAC reaches a conclusion, as it did in C3, that uh, a deprivation decision has left someone stateless, uh, it is implicitly finding the UK was in breach of Article 8.1. So you must put that right. Yeah. What you, 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 what you, the first point in our submission. And would the person not have been deprived of statelessness? Can we retroactively say, well, don't worry about it. For two years, we refused him every assistance the British citizen was entitled to have, and we treated him shockingly. Wouldn't let him come and visit his dying mother. Wouldn't let him come and um, speak to his family. But it doesn't matter now. Sayak has found it shouldn't have happened, therefore it did not happen. What is the Stateless Convention about? Legal formality or substance? Well, it, it, it's about substance, but, but, but it goes back to my point about, about, and using, if you like, the facts of set A as an example, that, that what actually we're... we're, we're they will not be stateless. That A will be a national of a friendly Commonwealth country with a long history. No, but my... my my point about it is, is that ZA now wants to... Have a different state. She's never been stateless and no. never will be. No, no, absolutely. I'm not saying that the Statelessness Convention directly governs her treatment. What she is also, what she is saying is, um, when I was born, um, my father... Um, should not have been deprived of his citizenship. Yeah. But he was. Uh, well, it, 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 we now know that that, that, that that deprivation was contrary to the um, uh, to Article Eight, mm -hmm. and uh, this is where the, the, the B two judgment fits in. Uh, Section forty in our submission, as is clear. Uh, it, it, from B2, uh, and it's page 357 of the authorities, tab 7. Specifically considering section 44, but in our submission there's no basis for just... Sorry, Mr. Sadiq, can you just give me a chance to catch up, please, with yep. the paragraph, please? Sorry, it's paragraph 96. 96, thank you very much. B2 is FAM, isn't it? It is FAM, but it's not, it's not, this passage well, didn't, wasn't really the subject of argument on in the Supreme Court, but, B, but my Lord is right, B2 is FAM. So how did that help? Because that didn't happen for ZA. It's, and it's, it's too late because it did happen for E2 and E3 and N3. Well, <laughs> my Lord, the point I'm making is that if Section 40 is to be construed consistent with the 1961 Convention, and Article 8 in particular of the 1961 Convention, yeah. then that implies, it goes back to my fundamental point, which is that, that, that why do the findings of fact of SIAC matter? They must matter because it's implicit in the legislation that you cannot be made stateless. You must uh, stop making him stateless. You, I mean, these are, I mean, it's a simple point. What is this convention about? Is it about trying to pretend that the actions that we took which were wrong aren't wrong? Or is it designed to try and stop people suffering? Well, I mean, we can't all. I mean, are you saying because SIA came to it, well, SIA never came to its decision, there never was a SIA decision here, the Secretary of State withdrew the decision. Could, can she avoid being in breach of Article 8 by taking the decision back two years later and pretending it never happened? Is that what Article 8 requires? 
she didn't say that. The, I, I, it, that's my. I, I would put it slightly differently, and I, and I, 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 I tried. I don't worry. I would put it slightly differently in the sense that I would submit that the, 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 um, the key point is that section 40 is to be interpreted consistently with it. That supports the argument that the reason why statelessness is an issue before SIAC is because fundamentally section 40 prevents statelessness. It, prevent, it means it's unlawful for the Secretary of State to... Uh, it means call, it's a breach of Article 8 of the International Treaty. It doesn't mean it's unlawful in the sense that that word is used in the context, for example, of prerogative remedies. Well, it has to be accurate about the use of words. Well, but, but, but I was using the word unlawful in the way I, I intended to use it. And I intended to use it in that way because of the, what I've been arguing for, which is that there is an implicit restriction within Section 40 that prevents the Secretary of State making someone unlawful. That's but why... Shouldn't have. But, in the, but in these earlier cases, and FAM is an example, B2 is an example, the court... It was accepted was that section four, they, the section forty, subsection four is is intended to give effect to this country's obligations under the statelessness convention. Then uh, the question of the interpretation of section forty is, isn't isn't determined by looking at Article Eight of the statelessness convention. But, but in any event, the language of section forty, subsection four, does not suggest that Parliament was. I'm going to keep coming back to this point, I might have very often left it, that Parliament is requiring the Secretary of State to get the decision right, which is, which is, which is why I'm struggling with your argument that um, somehow the statute must be, that, that, that Article 8 of the Stateless Convention somehow helps us understand the statute. Well, this Parliament could have said um, that could have made, could have made, could, could have met, oh, had a provision that just said, didn't use the words he satisfies, just if it, if it renders the state. You could also have said if it, that any order that's made can be quashed by SIAC, which that's not what any of this legislation says. Well, the way in which I would submit, uh, uh, the, the, in, the way that, one should look at this, is, is, is this, that, that, that the language of section 40, in part, uh, subsection 4, in part reflects the fact that, 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 that there is a desire to make sure that he, the Secretary of State, uh, there was an intent to make sure that the Secretary of State addressed this specific issue, because of course, quite often, when a decision is made under section uh, 42, uh, subsection 2, which is mm -hmm. what's an issue, the, the um, conducive provisions, the Secretary of State will not have, for example, any representations from the individual. The, the, the decision will be taken without any input, without any assistance from the individual about their status. The, the, the matter then goes on appeal, and obviously by the time of the appeal, the, the, the individual will have a right to be heard and will quite often have put forward evidence as to what their, their citizenship is. And so there is then fact-finding. But, but it goes back, the, the issue remains the same, which is statelessness, and that's why the findings of fact matter, because fundamentally what this legislation, which is consistent with the Statelessness Convention, is intended to do what these provisions are intended to do is ensure that people aren't stateless. Um, this, this was 1961, wasn't it? Yeah. And in 1981, the provision in question, if you look at the original one, was uh, different. It was where it appears to the Secretary of State that the person is stateless, and it only provided um, for that to be a defence. I haven't got the 48 Act in front of me now, I had it yesterday in one set of circumstances, not in all sets of circumstances. Well, it, it, it still doesn't provide for, it to, for there to be a defence in all circumstances, but that's because the other circumstances are um, ones which are... Permitted. Permitted, permitted under the Convention. So we're, we're in a position where the, the, the statelessness restriction is intended to mirror effectively the, 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 the circumstances in which the statelessness pro prohibition a, a, a applies mirror the provisions of the statelessness convention. So you can, the Secretary of State can deprive someone of citizenship in circumstances where they become stateless. Um, 
If it's fraud. If it's fraud, which is consistent with the with, with, with the Satanistness Convention. The 48 Act, or uh, the 81 Act also said that if you disloyal to Her Majesty, you can remove statelessness. And that's not um, provided for in the Satanist Convention, is it? Which makes me think that the 1981 Act was a poor stab at implementing the Statelessness Act. There were a number of categories, one of which was um, if you showed disaffection to Her Majesty. Uh, but, but as currently drafted, it plainly now has been amended in the manner that is intended to ensure. So it does reflect. Um, I'm trying to remember that there is uh, um, a sort of bad, bad character. Provision. So is your submission that the statute is consistent with the Statelessness Convention or that it ensures compliance with it? Because I'm not sure they're the same thing, and I'd like to know which, which position you're taking. I'm submitting that it is intended to ensure compliance. Sorry. Well, what I, the, the reason I was saying consistent, just to be clear, was, was in answer to a question from my Lord Lord Justice Lewis, um, in the sense that, 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 that it, the exceptions now to the requirements in subsection 4 are, they do reflect the exceptions to <coughs> Article 8.1. Well. Would you accept that the draft in Section 44 um, is not consistent with an intention to ensure absolute compliance with Article 8.1 of the Statements of Convention? Well, that's where, well, I, no is the answer to that, I suppose, in the sense that what, what I would submit is that when that section, and it comes back to the points we make about, uh, about the uh, impact of the appeal, when that is then read with the appeal provisions and what the, um, and what SIAC or the upper tribunal will be looking at out on an appeal, Compliance is achieved because ultimately um, the individual is able to vindicate their rights by demonstrating that they are in fact stateless. So this goes back to the other question. It goes back to the other question. It goes around in circles. Oh. <coughs> okay. uh, my Lord, there are, looking at my notes, there are, my Lord's my lady rather, that there are. Um, two issues that I, I um, have addressed. Uh, one I probably have indire indirectly addressed. I'm not sure that it will assist to go through it in greater detail, but I'm happy to if it would. And that is um, what I've referred to as, uh, as the approach now in public law, in, uh, Magera, Magera and other cases about the effect of... Um, uh, a, 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 a finding essentially that a decision is unlawful, what, what the retrospective effect is. And I, just in summary, and I can go into further detail, but in summary, what we submit that what that demonstrates is that the where it is concluded that a, a decision is unlawful, um, the effect of that uh, in terms of matters that occurred before the, the finding that the, that the decision was unlawful um, depends on the circumstances uh, and uh, depends on, for example, um, and this is a particularly significant factor, whether you're looking at the effect on a third party. So that, for example, a third party is in a better position to rely on a historic unlawful decision that hasn't yet been set aside or been ruled to be unlawful. Um, uh, but the general approach remains in our submission that, that where a decision was unlawful, um, it, 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 it has no effect. That, I accept, depends uh, uh, to a large extent. The relevance of that obviously depends on what I spent most of the morning arguing about, which is uh, whether or not uh, um, the effect uh, uh, of a finding that uh, at the time of a decision uh, an individual was stateless is that that decision was unlawful. Yeah. So that's why I'm, I, I'm not sure it would assist hugely. 
No, it's really if you if you're right, then what's the consequence? Right? Yeah, I'm not sure yeah. that's necessarily disputed. Yeah, if you were right, then that would be the consequence. Yeah. The yeah. other I issue, which I I is sort of a discrete issue, is obviously the, the position of ZA, given that um, ZA uh, won, um, well, not ZA won, Z today has never brought lit uh, litigation before this litigation, but her father won uh, a a a a before SIAC, uh, and there was no stay of the decision. Uh, um, Obviously, our position in relation to that is in the absence of the stay, um, the findings of SIAC uh, had uh, immediate effect. But that comes back to the issue of whether uh, there is a requirement effectively to implement the decision um, in some way, um, or whether SIAC's decision effectively has automatic effect. Um, you normally stay in order, you see. Normally you have an order saying you must do something like an injunction or um, an order that will have a legal effect. But here there wasn't a stay of an order because there never was an order as such as SIAC. So it's, it's, it's the same question really, isn't it? Well, except, except it doesn't... I, I, I clearly accept that, 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 that <laughs> if, for example, you're appealing from the High Court, what you would normally do is, is, is need to stay an order of the High Court. However, if you look at the terms of CPR 5216, um, which we have, we didn't, it's, it's set out in our skeleton. We, we have got full copies of it. Do you want me to go to the microphone? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We can probably got a separate one there. Mm -hmm. Six, 62, what? 16. Mm -hmm. There are two features of 5216 that suggest that principle is perhaps broader than my lawyer put to me. The first is that, that, that if the concluding words of that provision are the appeal should not operate as a stay, or stay from any order or decision of the lower court implying that it's not simply an order. And consistent with that, there is um, a, an express exclusion of that principle in the context of the immigration and asylum chamber of the upper tribunal, mm -hmm. indicating that the provisions potentially apply to, for example, tribunals, um, which don't generally make orders. So the the... The implication of that is that, that, in general, if you've got something like a tribunal, which is not issuing, and SIAC is effectively like a tribunal, that is not issuing orders, it, 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 you still need to apply for a stay of the decision. To stop the decision having effect. To have stop the decision having the effect. So if the decision, it, it comes back to, and I accept this, and that's one of the reasons why I wasn't going to spend a huge amount of time on this. But, but it comes back to the same point, though, doesn't it? I mean, if you're right on your main point, then this th this follows. Well, exactly, my lord. But if, in, if you're not, then <coughs> if the effect of, of what SIAC did was not that um, the original decision was rendered unlawful by by SIAC's judgment, then, yes, it, it, then the point doesn't get you anywhere. I'd put it slightly differently, but it may not make any material difference. Yes, right. I'd put it in, in this way, that if if if... If I'm right, obviously it, it potentially makes a difference. If 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 it's correct that the Secretary of State needs to implement what SIAC has done, then obviously it, 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 I accept that it doesn't make it it, it doesn't it doesn't help. Um, um, mm. So so yes, right. Well, I think you've actually got to say the decision to make the order was unlawful, and the order made as a consequence of the decision is also unlawful. I think you're saying two separate legal acts. Mm. Well. My lord, there are, there are two, if the decision, I mean, the appeal is against the decision, so yeah. I've, I, my argument is focused on the decision, but if, uh, if the decision itself is, 
unlawful because it produced statelessness. In our submission, then, the de deprivation order must be unlawful for, for two reasons, potentially. One, a condition precedent, which is the decision, because it could quite clearly, under the current scheme, is, is a required first step before making the deprivation order. If that has been held to be unlawful, then there is the condition precedent falls away. The second point is that if it is implicit, as we argue, within section 40, that um, uh, a finding of um, uh, statelessness means that the decision was unlawful, it must also be implicit that that, 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 that finding of statelessness also means that the deprivation order is unlawful because it, it would make no sense to have a prohibition on the decision being contrary, being resulting in statelessness, uh, but not having the same impact on the deprivation order. Right. So that's why we say if, we, if, if an appeal has the consequences that we argue for, that must also impact on the deprivation order. Okay. Well, can I just turn around to those behind me? And yes. I think probably I've uh, covered everything. Yeah, I need to cover everything. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Chair. My lords, my lady, uh, the primary submission I make on this appeal is this is the same as the primary submission I made at first instance. Yes. Uh, which is that the fact that the deprivation orders uh, had the effect of rendering the appellant stateless, as eventually established through the appellate process does not mean that the decisions to make the orders, or indeed the orders themselves, were unlawful when they were made. And, and that is so, um, I submit, for two interconnected reasons. Uh, the first is that section 44 of the BNA does not prohibit the making of a deprivation order, or indeed a decision to make a deprivation order, where the effect is to render the individual stateless, it simply imposes a requirement that the Secretary of State may not make such an order if she is satisfied that it will have this effect. And the wording of the statute in my submission is clear. The second connected reason is that a statutory appeal to SIAG against the decision to make a deprivation order on statelessness grounds is not directed to the lawfulness on public law principles of the decision to make the order. It is directed to the question of whether, as a matter of fact, and on the evidence before the Commission at that stage, the effect of the order has been to render the individual stateless. And the nature of the inquiry conducted by SIAC and crucially, the remedies available to SIAC reflect that fundamental nature of the appeal. Now, my lords, my lady, can I take those two interconnected reasons briefly in turn? I'm conscious that, that much of this ground has already been covered. Yeah. The starting point, uh, as far as the uh, Act is concerned, uh, it is plainly the clear wording of section 44, which I know the court has well in mind. Mm. Secretary of State may not make a deprivation order if satisfied that the order would make a person stateless. Uh, and that uh, condition precedent um, was plainly uh, expressly imposed by Parliament uh, in circumstances where it could, as my Lord has uh, uh, observed now, more than once, it could have imposed a different condition precedent, namely the Secretary of State may not make a deprivation order if the effect would be to render the individual stateless. That submission was a submission we made at first instance and was expressly endorsed, as my Lord has seen, um, by Mr Justice Jay. Yeah. Uh, that being so, satisfied 
concept of being satisfied does have, as was held by the Court of Appeal in E3, does have a clear and important meaning in this context. It defines the statutory condition precedent in that it identifies that which must be done by the Secretary of State. Now, of course, Lord Wilson was correct to say in al when considering the concept of being satisfied in relation to an entirely different argument, that being satisfied of a fact does not alter or enlarge upon the fact itself, whilst that's, of course, it's true as an observation, that is not the issue here. The issue here is simply whether the condition imposed by the statute is that the effect of a deprivation order must be established conclusively as a fact before the order is made, or whether it is merely that the Secretary of State be satisfied before the order is made. And in my respectful submission, the wording of the statute could not be clearer um, as to which is correct. Can I deal briefly at this point with Al Jeddah? So sorry, one. Yeah, no, I'm just thinking about if if it if it had said, um, if it had put it in an objective terms, then in in practical in practical terms, the Secretary of State would have great difficulty in making um, decisions or, or or orders for that matter. Yes, because it would always be said, well, hang on a moment objectively, actually, I am rendered stateless, and then we have to have endless expert evidence about that before the Secretary of State can make a decision. Quite, my Lord. And, and in, insofar as it matters, for the purposes of the construction argument, insofar as it matters, our submission is that there is a clear and obvious rationale for, yeah. the, for um, the formulation that Parliament has chosen. Yeah. These decisions, as um, was observed um, both by Mr Justice Jay first instance, and indeed in a different constitution of SIAC in G3, and we've given the references in our skeleton yeah. argument, yeah. these decisions are often made in time-sensitive situations mm -hmm. in the public interest on grounds of national security. Mm -hmm. And in that context, it is not surprising mm -hmm. that the Secretary of State is not required to convene a symposium of Bangladeshi law experts to thrash through over the course of about six days, as was the case in this litigation, um, uh, the nuances of Bangladeshi law in order to be able to make a decision under the statute. It makes perfect sense, um, looked at sensibly, uh, that Parliament should have imposed a requirement in these terms. Sorry, you're going to show yourself, Jack. I was going to yeah. take you briefly to Al Jeda, um, my lord, uh, uh, only because much of the exchange with my, my learned friend on Al Jeddah mirrors paragraphs 36 to 40 of our skeleton argument, in which we make the essential point that really um, there is no significant dispute between Lord Wilson in Al Jeddah and the Court of Appeal in E3, because Lord Wilson in Al Jeddah and the Court of Appeal in E3 were looking at the word satisfied for completely different reasons and in response to completely different arguments. Um, Lord Wilson's remarks in Al Jeddah at paragraph um, 30, and the, the last yeah. few lines that my learned friend relies upon, I'm so sorry, it's tab three, yeah. page 212. Mm -hmm. Lord Wilson's remarks in Al Jeddah were made in the context of an argument about what the Secretary of State had to be satisfied of and whether satisfied in that context could be stretched in effect, such that the Secretary of State could say, I'm not satisfied that the order would make a person stateless because they could take reasonable steps to avoid that situation. And it was in that context that his observation that the effect, so sorry, his observation to the effect that the requirement to be satisfied of a fact doesn't enlarge or alter the nature of the uh, uh, of what I should be satisfied makes perfect sense. The question is statelessness, not how you got to be stateless, or as um, he puts it in paragraph 32, the causative yeah. potency of various factors. And uh, we refer in, in our skeleton argument in passing to... It's the point that comes 
what it comes to is the point he makes in 33, isn't it? After the words would make a person stateless, it could have added the words in circumstances in which he has no right immediately to acquire the nationality of another state. But, so that, yes. that's what the, this argument was all about, because the, the Secretary of State was trying to say, well, uh, this is all Mr. This is effectively Mr. Al Jeddah's own fault, because he could always have applied to be an Iraqi citizen. Yes. And all Lord Wilson doing is, is whether um, having to be satisfied within section 40, subsection 4, entitled the Secretary of State to effectively yeah. look beyond the immediate effect of what he or she was doing. Quite. So, so the, the issue is what, what does the Secretary of State have to be satisfied of? Is it merely statelessness or does it go beyond mm -hmm. statelessness to the causation of that statelessness? Mm -hmm. Well, no, Lord Wilson says it's the former and, and, and statelessness is a fact, pure and simple, and, and satisfied doesn't change the nature of the fact. But as I say, oh, I mean, here, it, 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 so sorry. rather like the point I was putting to you a moment ago, if the statute had, uh, had imposed an objective test, you'd, you'd be running into a not dissimilar problem if you, if you, you know, if the Secretary of State has exceeded in this case, then you've got all sorts of questions about, you know, what was Mr. Arjeda somebody who really could have applied for the Iraqi citizenship? Did he have a good reason for not applying for Iraqi citizenship? Etc. Etc. Et all sorts of factual inquiries which can't really be, in practical terms, dealt with at the time when the Secretary of State is making a decision, which is actually whether it's conducive to public good or in yeah. national interest that this person retains British citizenship or is deprived of it. Yes, quite so, my lord. But the, 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 impo the importance of this, and the reason I'm going to it at the, at the outset, is, is, to make the, is to make good the submission that Mr Justice Jay was quite correct to identify that in this particular context, in other words, what does satisfied mean for the purposes of defining the statutory precondition? This court's judgment in E3 was indeed binding. Because in E3, as my, as, as my Lord knows full well, um, this court held that satisfied does have a clear and important distinct meaning because it defines what it is that the Secretary of State has to do in order lawfully to exercise the power conferred on her under Section 40. Subsection two. You've applied lawfully and unlawfully. One way of reading the statute is it's got two levels of safeguards. The Secretary of State shouldn't make it if she's satisfied the person will be stateless, but she can get it wrong. And there's a second safeguard. The tribunal can look, or the sire can look at it to see if it's mm. right or wrong. Yes. And the question is when the second one looks at it and disagrees with the first one. What did Parliament intend to happen? That from now on, the second one prevails and the Secretary of State will put things in order, or that the Secretary of State will go back and try to unravel what she'd done first time round? And that's the issue, really, isn't it? Yes, my Lord, it, it, it is. And my, my submission is that if it were the latter, then the Act would have been drafted differently. So, so she has the power to give effect impliedly to the new finding of status. So, so she could withdraw the order after a decision of the sire, could she? Yes. And if she sees the writing on the wall and she can see that sire is going to find against her because just recently it's so found in another tribunal, she has an implied power to withdraw it even before the sire decision. Is that correct? Well, yes, my lord, that's in effect what happened What happened yeah. uh, in the particular context of this case. The reason I ask that question is to ask you another question. Does she then have an implied power to withdraw it with effect from a date earlier than the date of her decision to withdraw? Could she choose to go back? Um, my lord, my... My... my, my tentative answer to that question is, is no. Because? Um, because there is no um, 
whilst the Secretary of State plainly has, uh, I, I would submit, an, an implicit power to withdraw a decision that has been made, there is nothing um, in the statute or, or anywhere else which confers a power on the Secretary of State retrospectively to, in effect, grant rights to an individual who was subject to uh, the order that she um, originally made. She's not granting rights. The rights come from the Act. The person doesn't have the rights because she's made an order. If she's got a power to withdraw that order because she sees the possibility of a SIAC decision, or because she suddenly discovers a new treatise on Bangladeshi law, which she reads every night and thinks, gosh, that's jolly convincing. So if she's got an implied power, the question then is, what are the limits on that? And it's not put in this case, I know, but whether that implied power might cause her to say, well, actually, I should withdraw it. And in fact, I'm going to withdraw it from the date of the, um, an earlier date. Yes, my lord, but I, I, I so I, I return, I, I suppose. The short answer is that's not this case, but well, um, <laughs> yes, uh, my lord's just exploring what the position um, might can be. be. C convenient as that, as that may be, <laughs> um, uh, I, I anticipate that my lord's going to want me to do a bit better than that. <laughs> and, and <laughs> this lord is the other two are keen. <laughs> and uh, the... Um, the best answer that, that, that I think I can give, my lord, is whilst it, 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 is, it is always, or, or um, at least in every scenario I can think of, um, within the implicit powers of uh, a decision maker uh, who has um, made an order to deprive somebody of something, to withdraw that order and thus lift the deprivation one would expect to see a, um, a, a basis for uh, the much more extensive implied power of retrospective withdrawal that had the potential not just to restore rights that had previously been deprived, but to um, effect the status of the individual in the intervening period and potentially affect third parties who had interacted with that individual during the intervening period. Now, we, in, in the subsidiary argument about whether unlawful administrative acts should be treated as a nullity, we cite a number of authorities, and I'll come to them in, in, in a minute, where the court says, in effect, retrospectivity is a big, is a big step. It's and an implied one power to withdraw, which means to take away the thing that stops the trip. It's not an implied power to seek to rectify matters in order of already concluded positions. Yes, that, that's that's the essence of it. And, and just to, and just to, well, just to, just to finish. An earlier example, it wouldn't be, it would be the retrospective retrospect, retrospectivity. So you're saying this, in effect, uh, an implied part say this never ever happened, and therefore you were always a British citizen yes. throughout. Uh, would enable hypothetically E3 to to um, to uh, uh, at least uh, pursue a complaint against the election official who'd refused to allow him to vote in the election. Uh, against a whole range of potential um, targets, my lord. I mean, as, as, as we've seen, in, for example, in Bangladeshi law, Bangladeshi law prohibits dual nationality. It yeah. might, what one could imagine a situation where an individual who has been deprived of British nationality gains the nationality of another state in the interim. Mm. Um, what, what, what then? Well, and votes in a Bangladeshi election, hmm. or doesn't vote in a British election, or is detained as N3 was by the French authorities on the basis that he had no right to enter the United Kingdom and might, if the Secretary of State were to wave a retrospective wand over this case, have a claim of an unlawful detention against the French yeah. authorities. The, the, the list goes on. And so, my, my, my Lord, I think one, that there is an important distinction between an implied power to withdraw 
and an implied power to retrospectively make right uh, or, or, or change the reality of what might be a period of several years. The statutory framework, given the safeguards, is there to put things right when a new state of facts, new state of facts is realised. Yes, my lord. In, in short, yeah. So I, I, I say uh, I, I say ye yes to an implied power to withdraw um, with effect from the date of withdrawal. No to an implied power retrospectively to do so. But it's not this case anyway, so I shouldn't trouble myself too much. But, but I, I anticipate that I've I've come I've come uh, at this point to answering my lady Lady Justice Lang's question uh, about what the Secretary of State is required to do in the event that um, uh, SIAC allows the appeal. And the short answer um, to my lady's question uh, is that. Uh, it is, yes, the Secretary of State is obliged to do what she did here, which is to give effect to SIAC's judgment by withdrawing the deprivation order, subject, of course, as here, to any appeal rights she might have um, against SIAC's decision. So not immediately, but at the end of the, at the, end of the line, um, in respect of any appeal, and mm -hmm. I, 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 I make the obvious but perhaps important point that this case, as indeed all of these cases, G3, um, lots of others, uh, were, were dealt with as preliminary issues. Statelessness was dealt with as a preliminary issue on the clear understanding of everyone involved that if the claimant won, appellant won, that would be determinative of the whole appeal. There was never a, never a suggestion that if, if the statelessness argument went in the appellant's favour, the Secretary of State would, um, uh, would say, oh, well, we still think you're a, a, a threat to national security. We'll litigate that aspect of the case, and then we'll decide what, if anything, we do well, about could, the deprivation. Well, you could envisage a situation, I suppose, where, for example, the Secretary of State wants to run an argument that the, that the application for nationality had been induced by fraud or misrep or whatever. And that was an, that gave rise to an issue. And But there was also an issue of statelessness. But that, that issue of misrepresentation would not, would not could only be determined on the facts. Yes. So there would be no point in having a preliminary issue no. there because you'd always have to determine the facts. But where, where you don't, where the reason for the deprivation is caught by section 40 subsection 4 as it is in this case then such a decision that yes. somebody was stateless is going to be an end of it isn't it yes subject to an appeal Qu quite so and, and 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 my lord will know my lady will know from from their experience in SIAC that that when it's a, a, a statelessness preliminary issue it is dealt with on that clear understanding yeah. this will be the, this will be the end and that it was the end in Al Jeddah, it was the end in FAM it was the end in G3 in in this series of cases and of course it was the end in C3 and C7 mm. um it it we, we, we may secretary of state may still think that you're a threat to national security yeah. may still think that your human rights arguments are are not very good um but if you win on statelessness as a preliminary issue that's that's the end because the secretary of state will do what she does um in, in what she has done in this case and all the others which is withdraw the order yeah uh, and that's and that's why um in my respectful submission mr justice jay there was nothing wrong with mr justice jay's analysis that you you don't need some express power under the act or anywhere would you else. It would be better if there was a statutory provision governing the power of the SIAC on the appeal and a statutory provision saying the Secretary of State what she must do. But we haven't got them and the Parliament hasn't put them there. No, well, well, we got close to having, well, got close to having that at, at one point with the power conferred on SIAC to make directions, but Parliament decided to take that away. Yeah. Does that do, as I suggested on one reading, the very fact that you had to have a power to treat it as if it was no effect means that without that power, that wasn't the natural consequence of the rest of the provision, or is it the repeal of the power that's significant? My lord, in my, in my, in my submission, it's, it's, it's probably both. The, the, um, I, I didn't put this entirely correctly in, in our written argument. The, 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 the point, the critical point here is not that if my learned friend is right, that the old 
Section 40A3 power was OTOs, it goes considerably beyond OTOs. Um, if my learned friend, it, it is directly contradictory to my learned friend's argument because if he's right and the effect of the appeal being allowed is automatically to rescind, quash, um, treat as if it were never um, of any legal effect, Lord the deprivation that the decision was unlawful. I'm so sorry, my lord. The effect of the finding is it's an automatic finding that the decision was unlawful. Yes. If that's, if, if that's right, then it, it's not simply a question of, of the old power to give a direction being OTOs. It, it's, it's actually that that power um, stands in, in direct contradiction to my learned friend's position. Because the clear, the clear effect would be, if SIAC does not exercise that power, then the order remains uh, good. The order remains in force. Well, it's an oddity. If it's automatically unlawful, why do you need a direction? If you may treat it as if it had no effect. Yes. Unless it was saying, unlawful, and we mean it, chaps, chapesses. <laughs> It's unlawful. Yes, so it's two things. It's the power, but it's also the terms in which the power is expressed yeah. because it's deeming that they can rather than provision making. Exactly, yeah. exactly, mm. so, exactly so. Exactly so. That, that's that's the submission I was I was groping towards. Yeah. Um, my lord, my lady, I, I was going I was going to turn next to the to the statelessness convention convention, um, uh, because I I do I need to deal with that. Briefly, because I, I fear that neither of us have, have, have got this quite quite right well, in terms of two o'clock, Mr. Shaw. So, so be it. Rise.